Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our services today, especially those of you that are visiting with us. You are our honored guest, and we invite you to come back any time that you're in the area. Um, as a reminder, we ask everybody to please check your cell phones and be sure they're put on silent or turned off during our service this morning. Let's remember those on our prayer list and those listed in the bulletin are sick and recovering from recent surgery and ongoing illness. Uh, the last leaders will not meet uh, today, uh, but we are planning a reception for the lads uh, on next Sunday evening, or I'm sorry, in two weeks on 421, so start making plans for that. The ladies' Monday class will meet tomorrow night at eight, on April 8th at 6.45 p.m. You're asked to please bring a snack, and all ladies are encouraged to attend. The ladies' Tuesday fellowship class will meet at 10 a.m. in the fellowship room. Remember our Wednesday night Bible studies at 7. The Talladega Church of Christ School of Bible Emphasis, their final class will be held on Thursday, April the 25th at 6 o'clock in their auditorium with Jimmy Clark as the teacher. Everyone's encouraged to uh, get one of the buckets in the fellowship room on the table and a list uh, to, and fill it in support of the Ukraine mission uh, and Chip McEwen's trip this fall. Also remember to help with the goal of 500 small blankets that can be purchased at Walmart or for $3 if you can find them. I've, I did see that Dollar General has them for 5 uh, but there, uh, there's a couple of samples up here on the front pew if anybody wants to see what type of blanket to get. I have a thank you card to share. It says, to our church family, we appreciate your prayers and encouragement during Harbor's NICU stay. We love you all, Roy, Brenda, Brad, and Maddie Johnson. This morning, Brother Darren Holland is leading our singing. Brother Gary Evans will have our opening prayer. Brother Billy Thompson, our closing prayer. At the appropriate time, Brother Mike Kaiser will bring the lesson. To begin our worship, I'll be reading from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Good morning. If you'd like to take your songbooks and turn to number 134, this will be our first song this morning, 134. You can also follow along behind me on the screen if you prefer that. Let us sing. God is a
Before the opening prayer, we'll sing 141, number 141. <clears throat> Let us sing. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God of heaven, our loving Father, Father, we come to you this morning with humble hearts, thanking you for all of the good that you do for us. Thank you, Father, for the food that we have to eat, the clothing that we wear, the houses that we have that shelters from the storms. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross of Calvary, that we might have a hope of eternal life. We praise thee, Father, for thy great wisdom, thy great love, thy great compassion. We thank you so much for those things that you do for us, for the attitude that you have toward us, the love that you have that you wanted us to be with you in heaven for eternity. Father, we uh, humbly beg of you this morning that as we come to you in prayer and tell you that we're not always the children that we, you would have us to be. We left things undone, and we do things we shouldn't do. And when we fail, Father, we ask you to be with us to, to forgive us of our failings, that we might be justified in your sight. Father, as we worship you this morning in song and in prayer, in remembrance of your son's death and suffering upon the cross of Calvary, the study of your holy word, we pray that you might be in our hearts, that you might give us an abiding love for your word, that we might have a desire always to learn more of you, that we might be pleasing servants of yours. Father, we ask you to be with those who uh, have lost loved ones, those who are ill. We pray that you might restore those to their health. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who serve our nation, that you'd be with those who serve your kingdom, in foreign lands, in places that are much dangerous. We pray that you might be with them and guard them and protect them and give much fruit to their efforts in your kingdom. We pray, Father, as we continue our worship this morning that you're pleased with what we do and say. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Before partaking of the Lord's Supper in just a moment, we'll sing number 114, number 114. Let us sing. I stand up. In order to help us prepare our minds and forget about worldly things and focus on the matter at hand, we will read Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. That's Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it. All of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please bless this loaf, which represents Christ's body, as he died on the cross for the remission of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Pray with me. Dear Lord, please bless this fruit of the vine, which represents your blood that was shed on the cross, that we may have the gracious opportunity to be saved. In Christ's name, amen. At this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to also pray for our contribution. We have a basket in the front and the rear. If anyone would like to contribute, let us pray. Dear Lord, we'd like to thank you for our homes. We'd like to thank you for all the financial blessings you bestow upon us each and every day. For there's too many blessings for us to name each individual one. Dear Lord, please help us to find it in our hearts to give back in accordance to thy will. In Christ's name, amen.
number 146, 146. Let us sing. Marvelous grace of our Our song following the lesson will be number 149, number 149. <clears throat> At the same opening, we'll sing number 148, number 148. Let us stand as we sing. <clears throat> Let us sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise him.
Be seated, please. It's certainly my pleasure to join that word of welcome to everyone that's here this hour for our morning worship service. I do acknowledge the fact, and looking out, we have some that are visiting with us today. We're always grateful for folks who come our way to visit with us. We count you as our guest indeed and hope that you'll come back every time that you have the opportunity to come our way. Now this morning, I want to call your attention to our Bible reading for the text of our sermon. Be taken from the book of 2 Peter. We'll be reading from chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, and we'll read down through verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, and going down through Verse 11, the apostle writing says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For these things be in you and abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall, for so an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Primarily focusing this morning upon that expression found in verses 10, making your calling and election sure. We're talking about this morning, making it sure, making it sure. Well, my friends, as we look at this passage, we know that Peter has just addressed the brethren on the fact that they've received wonderful promises from the Lord. And this passage is based upon the fact that those promises are ours to enjoy. Now, before we get into our sermon, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Holy Father in heaven, again, we're thankful for this Lord's day that thou hast blessed us with. Lord, we're thankful we can be with those of like precious faith. And Father, we're thankful for the, thy word which is before us today. And we pray that thou will add thy blessing to the reading of thy word. And help us, O Lord, as we now will speak upon these things that Peter's wrote about, that we might speak about these matters in a truthful and sound way. Lord, bless us in our journey to heaven. Help us, O Lord, to make our calling and election sure. Help us, O Father, to glorify Thee in all that we say and do. And may even this hour be to Thy praise and Thy glory as we continue through it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Making it sure. How many times has somebody said to you, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, oftentimes we use that expression, are you sure? As we talk about things. Somebody may say something like this to you. Um, uh, are, are you sure that you have your cell phone with you this morning? Are you sure? Well, what are you looking for right now? Some of you started looking for something, didn't you? Are you sure you got your cell phone with you? Are you sure you turned it off? You know, sometimes I thought I've turned mine off, only to discover when the service came to close, mine was on full blast. I'm just glad I don't have friends like the rest of you have who call me on my cell phone. Because I can carry my phone all day long. And the only people that call me are folks who want to sell me a seat cover for my car or some kind of Medicaid insurance. Those are the only folks I really hear from these days. The only friends I really have in the world. I'm not saying that because I want you to start calling me every day because indeed, I enjoy the peace and quiet in my office when I'm studying. Otherwise, how can you nap if your phone's ringing? So there you are, my friends, about carrying this business called the cell phone. But are you sure your cell phone is turned off right now? How about other matters, my friends? Are you sure you got your credit card with you? Have you checked today as to whether or not you really have your debit card? You know, somebody told me the other day they stopped someplace to shop for something, go went the debit card out and didn't even have it with them. That's a terrible feeling, isn't it? Not to have your debit card with you. And you think you're in a world full of friends, but the first in line behind you is not going to loan you their debit card. It's kind of like you just leave your stuff on the counter and go find your card and then come back. Are you sure you got your credit card with you today? My friends, are you sure? How many times will you ask that question about matters? Are you sure? Now, the Apostle Peter addressed this matter regarding our salvation. He tells us, here we are, we're pilgrims on the road to heaven. 
Pilgrim is on the road to heaven. He says, now there are things in which you can measure your progress on this journey that you're making. Are you adding to your faith these things, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and God is brother kindness and love? Now, I remember when I was a young fella, which is a long time ago. That's a real challenge to the memory. But nevertheless, I can remember when I was about 10 years old, the preacher had this in his sermon every week, this passage of scripture. And by the time I was 10 and a half, I had that passage memorized, just hearing the preacher quoted every Sunday in the sermon. Very easy passage to memorize, is it not? Add to your faith. But do we take it to heart? Do we know what Peter was talking about? Are you adding to your faith? Are you growing in your grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's the question. Are you growing in these matters? And Peter tells brethren now, there's a possibility that you could be nearsighted. In other words, you're so interested in the things of this world, you're not concerned about the eternal home over yonder. And because you're so nearsighted, all you can see is what's in you in this life. You can't see what's beyond this life. And Peter warns the brethren now, don't be nearsighted. Don't be nearsighted. Make your calling and your election sure. And so I raise the question for your consideration. Heaven is over there. We're on that journey to heaven. Are you sure you're making progress on this journey? Are you sure you're on the right path going to heaven? Are you sure about that matter? Now, Peter told those brethren, now, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Give diligence to this matter. Just don't think about it every now and then, my friends. Let it be a constant concern in your heart and your life. That beyond this life, there's another life. Am I heading the direction that I need to be going? Am I sure about these matters? Well, look at this passage of scripture. There are two things that, first of all, stand out. Peter talks about a calling, and, and then he talks about an election. Calling and election. I know that sometimes folks just get, use a word we used in class this morning, bum fuzzled, when you use such words as a calling and the election. And why do folks get somewhat confused about these matters? It's because there's so much out there of a false doctrine in the world, bum fuzzling people about the matter of their calling and their election. Exactly, my friends, what is the calling? The calling, my friend, is the call of the gospel. You know, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's the great gospel invitation. The Lord's saying, I come unto me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. There's the gospel call, my friends, the call of the gospel message. That's the calling that's under consideration. You know, Jesus said to us, The many are called, but few are chosen. The Spirit and the bride says, Come. Let him that heareth say come. Let him that thirst come. Whoso will and come and drink of the water of life freely. Our Lord likened the gospel to a great feast being spread out in which the Lord sends forth his service to invite people to come to the feast. And you say, friend, what are you doing today? If you ask me that question, what are you doing today? It's my job, my friends, to make sure that you know about the gospel feast and that you're invited to partake of that feast, to call you to that feast. That's my responsibility as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How's this calling going to take place? I know some folks think about something mysterious happening to you, something better felt than told, uh, some operation upon your heart directly in part from the word of God. And they say, uh, this is something mysterious in its very nature. My friends, the gospel message is the way we're called. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you're looking for something mysterious to happen to you, my friend, that's not the gospel call. You know, somebody says, I know the Lord called. How do you know the Lord called you? Well, I was washing dishes. Oh, my friend, while I was washing dishes, the hummingbirds came and fed at the feeder. And I got so elated about this matter and overjoyed within my heart. And I just knew the Lord was calling me. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was a hummingbird. Don't mistake the calling of the gospel, the hummingbird, the kitchen window. Don't mistake the gospel message, my friends, with something that doesn't happen to your chewing gum on the bedpost when you stick it there overnight. I can tell some of you are too young to even know that song, but anyway, your chewing gum will lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight, okay? That will happen. But some folks think, oh, something mysterious has got to take place, like just new in this world around me. No, my friends, the gospel message is the gospel call. There's the calling. When the gospel message is being preached, it's the Lord saying, come unto me, because I've got something you need. 
And my friends, I would hope today that if you're here and you've never answered the gospel call, that you'll do so. You'll answer the gospel call. It's time to answer the gospel call. Time to answer that call. Jesus is saying to you, if you're not a saved person, come unto me right now and I'll give you rest. The Lord is saying to you, if you wander back in the world, become a backslider, come on home right now. You need the rest I have for you, the spiritual refreshment I'm offering you. What is the election then, my friends? Well, it's not something in which God shows some partiality. You know, that idea that God elected some people to be saved and left the left of us out of the question, now again, that's not Bible doctrine. That's just as false as the idea of something mysterious happening to happen before the gospel message comes to you. The Lord wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The apostle Peter declared that to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. He said to Cornelius this, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. But God is no respecter of persons. God didn't reach into the hat and pull my name out and then tell you your name wasn't even in the hat to begin with. But that's the idea that some folks have. God foreordained, predestined for the world, began the exact number, got the names down. Who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. That, my friend, that's not the election under consideration. Everybody's included in the gospel call. And how are we going to make the calling and the election sure? Well, my friends, look at people in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. What did they do? The gospel called them. They made their election sure. They obeyed the gospel. Look at that man from Ethiopia. What happened to him? The gospel called him. What did he do? He made a share. He answered the call. He obeyed the gospel. Look at that jailer, my friends. The gospel came to him. He, he heard the call. He made a share. He obeyed the gospel. And so, my friends, there must be an obedient response to our gospel when it's preached to us. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin and death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, being then made free from sin, Paul wrote. You became, you became, when you obeyed from the heart, you became the servants of righteousness, making the calling and the election sure. Now, how are we going to make it sure? By obeying what we know the Lord commands us to do. I think about those folks that Peter was writing to there. They said, now, you give all diligence. Evidently, Peter was writing to some brethren who were not being very diligent about matters. He said, now, time for you to wake up, give all diligence. You put your effort into this matter. You think about this matter. It's a matter of spiritual concern to you. Make it sure. Give all diligence. How are you going to do this? Peter said, you add to your faith. And they said, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and God is brother kindness and love. You make sure you do this. Now that's how they're going to make it sure, making sure they do what the Lord tells them to do. Now, the great fault with some folks is this. We want to go through the gospel message like we're going through the buffet line. And I've used this illustration before. Not everything on the buffet table is something I like. Not everything. Brussels sprouts. What can you say? Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts? Hominy? I know some of you maybe love Brussels sprouts and hominy, and some of you may even love it together in a casserole, for all I know. But you see, when I go through the line, I pass that up. Pass it up. You know, I'm married to a woman. I don't understand what happened to her, but she loves chicken livers. And I believe if she were to turn the steering wheel loose in front of the chicken place on the day they have the sign out, chicken livers today, that that thing would just jump the curb and go right on in there for chicken livers. She likes them. Disgusting. 
Now the whole world knows about the problem in my marriage. We just told the whole world today. It went out on the internet. There it is, out there on the internet. All right. Now, what may I illustrate is this. You and I cannot go through the word of God and say, I like that, but I don't like that. That's the point. And many folks think I have that too when they read the Bible. Well, I like what that word has to say, that command has to say. I can agree with that command. That's all right with me. I like that. But that one right there, I don't like it at all. Don't have anything to do with it. If you're going to make your calling and election sure, my friends, one thing has to take place, and that is this. Your obedience to the Lord is complete obedience to the Lord, not a pick and choose obedience to the Lord. Not a pick and choose matter. And that's true whether or not we're a person who's not a Christian. Some folks look at a command of the gospel message, uh, the, those first principles that we have the steps we take into Christ. Some folks say, well, I like faith, I like uh, baptism, I don't care about doing repentance. That's kind of pressing the matter too much. But I'm going to have a change of mind that results in a change of life. I'm glad to say I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized, maybe try to get in the church, but that business of repentance, I don't need that. Or I don't need baptism. How do we go about choosing those commands we like and we don't like? That's not making the calling and the election sure. I can't say, well, you know what? I like this business of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But you know, this business about giving as I've been prospered, nah, that's not for me. That business about being regular in my church attendance, that's not for me. That business about loving my neighbor as myself, preacher, you don't know my neighbor. he got the stink in this garbage can in town. You just don't know my neighbor. You don't know my neighbor, preacher. You see how we go through the word of God and we say, well, I think I can call that command out because it just doesn't suit my disposition about matters. Does not suit my thoughts about matters. Doesn't suit my, what can I say? My, my beliefs about matters. My orientation about matters. No, my friends, when the word of God speaks to us, Every command of the Lord for us is precious. It's truthful. It's for our benefit. No command the Lord ever gave to us is a grievous command that's a hurtful command for us. It's for our good. But know this. How do we make our calling and election sure if we start trying to tell the Lord how to run his business? And that's what happens sometimes, is it not? We want to inject our opinion about something the Lord says as if we can tell the Lord how to run his business. And Lord, if I'm going to tell you how to run your business, then you operate your business according to my plan, not your plan. People have a strange disposition sometimes to what the word of God has to say to them. And sometimes we just like to be forgetful of anything the Lord says. Because if we are mindful of what it says, then sometimes it bothers our conscience too much. It's better to be forgetful and neglectful and pass it over and be indifferent than to really apply our heart and our soul to what the Lord has to say to us. And so when Peter told these brethren now, you give diligence. You've got exceeding great and precious promises that have been given to you. And friends, we're in possession of the greatest promises we could ever talk about. And the Lord said, now, with not in these promises, you be diligent to add to your faith. Don't allow yourself, Peter says, become nearsighted to where all you can see is this world and not what's beyond this life and the world to come. And then he said this. Here's the end result. If you do these things, you will never fall. I know there's a popular doctrine that says, once saved, always saved. And I've, I look at some statements of the word of God and I'm thinking now, why would you say once saved, always saved, that Peter said, if you do these things, you'll never fall, because the opposite would be, if you don't do these things, you're going to fall. Otherwise, why would he have said that? And so we are negligent, my friends. What is the possibility? What is the possibility if we're negligent? Abundant entrance. 
into the everlasting kingdom. A rich entrance into the everlasting kingdom. What a beautiful thought that is. The Apostle Peter, uh, not the Apostle Paul, get the apostle straight there, get the right apostle in the picture there. The apostle Paul spoke of someone being saved as by fire. As by fire. Oh, my friends. Wood, hay, and stubble sometimes gets into our life, gets into our work for the Lord. But my friends, let's make sure we're not allowing wood, hay, and stubble to get in the way of our spiritual growth. An everlasting kingdom, eternal kingdom, the kingdom of glory. So an abundant entrance of interest to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Three things are said in that passage there. First of all, the kingdom's everlasting. Okay? Everlasting. Also, something in the future. We're not in the kingdom right now. As a kingdom belongs to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Abundant entrance to the everlasting kingdom. Project yourself for just a moment to the judgment day. And the Lord says to you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. What a beautiful thought. What a comforting thought. The knowing life journey has been brought to a close. And the Lord now states the verdict. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Of all the things in life that you and I desire, no matter what our situation in life may be, it ought to be when life's journey has been brought to a close that the Lord will find us as those who have made our calling and election sure. And he says to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, the everlasting kingdom, the abundant entrance. Because the Lord, my friends, was glorified with our life. Not all of us can be preachers, not all of us can be elders, not all of us can be deacons, not all of us can be so forced to be married to an elder, a preacher, or a deacon. Okay? But all of us can be faithful servants of the Lord. And the words of our Lord on that last day are words we can hear if we grew in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and added to our faith with great diligence those things that kept our mind on heaven until the end. In old Roman days, it was said concerning those who were applicants to a political position that they, were, they wore a white robe, and they were called a candidate. In fact, that word candidate is a word which denotes the idea of being robed in white. The candidate for heaven, my friend, is that person who washed their robe and made it white in the blood of the Lamb. Have you been washed in the blood? This morning as we extend the invitation, I ask you the question, have you made your calling and your election sure? If you've never obeyed the gospel, is it not time to give your heart and your life to the Lord? Come to Jesus this morning, my friends, with a penitent, believing heart. Be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins. If you've not been faithful to the Lord, then come back home. If we can help you with heaven's call, we invite you to step forward. Together we stand and sing our invitation song.
embarrassed? To embarrass people, sometimes they have to. Brian Butler, is that you? Am I seeing double? It might be. What's their names? All right. Have we met them before? No, we haven't. And what's their brother's name? Where's he at there? How old is he? Four. He's not old enough to request prayer yet. <laughs> but I can see with the bows in the hair, and it won't be long, he'll be here with Christian prayer. Yeah, I can you that. Okay. Well, glad to see you this morning. Glad you brought the babies down to entertain great grandmother and grandparents and, and entertain me too. Proud to see you. Proud to see you very, very much. I know people want to kind of peek a peep at the babies and you take a quarter piece, you'll get 50 cents. Now, some folks just have one at a time, only get a quarter, but she can get 50 cents a time looking. So glad to see you this morning. Come back and see us more often. Would you do that? You just move to Silicon if you want to. Yeah, all right, that'd be good. That'd be good. I don't like to embarrass people, but now you might want to talk to a Johnson fellow here. He, he knows that. We got some suspects for your sons there. You <laughs> Yeah, twin there. All right. <clears throat> Hope you'll be back tonight. Turn now to number 136. We'll sing one verse and then be led in a closing prayer. 136. Let us sing. Father, we're thankful to you for your son, for the church, and for the opportunity we've had to come before you and worship. We pray our worship service has been pleased and acceptable to you. We ask for your watch, care, and protection till we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.